I'm Lena Dunham, and this is not funny. How could fear be a gift? Well, it is. These feelings are gifts. They're not things we should ignore. The gift of fear is a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD all rolled into one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. What is this place? Oh, we've taken you to a sneaky place. <laughs> uh, this is where uh, the protectors with my company get training. Wow. And so they are trained on that jet, on jet evacuation techniques, and they're trained on anti-assassination strategies. And, uh, and I know it's a weird place, and thank you for coming down all the tunnels and, and making the journey. I literally feel like I'm in a cooler Disneyland. Ah, well, we have, no, we have no ticket prices, but maybe that's a good business. I want to come and spend a good week learning here and then claim to be a Gavin De Becker trained protector. You are invited. Thank you. I may actually take you up on it. I have some time off coming. <laughs> well, I'm really incredibly grateful to be here with you. I hopefully have expressed to you in person how much Gift of Fear has meant to me and so many women I love as not just a how-to for thinking about protecting ourselves, but also a validation of so many feelings that we've all had and been mm. unable to express for fear of seeming like the whiner or seeming like the girl who cried wolf. That to me is the reason that I return to the book again and again. Mm. I've really internalized and soaked up like a sponge the practical information, but it's that continuing validation of my feelings, not just as a public figure, but as someone who's walked through the world with a female body for 30 years. And mm. I love to refer to you as our nation's greatest feminist because the fact that that came from a man and that a man took the time to so carefully study what makes women feel unsafe and what makes women targets is just incredibly meaningful. Thank you, thank you. What I wanted and what I meant at the time was to give permission, to give permission for being rude, to give permission to not smile, to give permission to not engage if you didn't want to, and to give permission to uh, accept those feelings because those feelings are just like your kidney or your lungs. They're there for a reason. You talk in your book about how the gift of fear came out of the experience of protecting public people and figuring out how to deal with unwanted attention. And it can seem as though the life of a celebrity and the life of someone who goes to an office shop and walks on the street are totally divided, but actually there's a way that the experience of celebrity is a heightened version mm. of what we are all experiencing, which is being forced to interact with a ton of people and really quickly make decisions about, are you safe? Are you safe? Is this okay? Am I all right in this situation? What I'm dealing with when I go to a meet and greet or when I go do a political event for Planned Parenthood isn't any different than what the average woman deals with every day. It's just a little bit in hyper speed mm. because of the kind of situation that I find myself in. So my hope is that when I talk about my experience reading your book, that it doesn't seem like some, you know, highfalutin Bergdorf's situation, but that it just seems like a woman who's been forced to face these things at sort of warp speed who's been blessed to face these things. I yeah. don't mean that public life is a blessing, but the blessing of awakeness and reality and paying yeah. attention is what gives life its real vitality. And learning to trust my instincts, which is truly something that the book gave me because before that, I think I thought of myself as a person with almost broken instincts. I think I thought certain people are born with great instincts about people and certain people aren't. And I didn't understand that actually it's a primal skill we can all tap into. Some of us have just buried it really deep for fear of offending, for fear of not fitting into our social environment, for fear of looking like a bitch, which is something you and I have talked about. And what is the acronym you have for bitch? Bitch is, uh, boys, I'm taking control here. It makes me so happy. I think mm. about it all the time. Mm. <laughs> I know you've made this walk, uh, as you say, with a woman's body for these 30 years, and you've had some experiences that were challenging. Yeah. And I see nonetheless this extraordinary courage in you. You, to me, are a gentle warrior, somebody who is out there willing to say it, willing to do it, 
and interestingly willing to say something that you know will offend in some cases, to do something that you know will be provocative in some cases. And I wanna know how you got that. Where did you get the permission to, to be you? Well, my experiences with harassment, my experience with assault, a lot of it came before I was a public figure. And that's the thing is all my experiences really just came from being female in the world and the vulnerabilities of mm. that. And also from experiences where I didn't feel like I had the right or the privilege to be, as you say, rude. But the interesting thing is that my mother really indoctrinated me from an early age. I grew up in New York City in Soho before it was sort of the chic, <laughs> gentrified neighborhood it is now where it was just warehouses and our car radio was stolen every week. And my mom said to me like, if a stranger talks to you and you don't like it, you scream at the top of your lungs. Mm -hmm. If somebody looks at you and you don't like how they looked at you, tell them to go fuck off and go running down the street. Like my mother could not have been stricter about the idea of following your instincts. We were basically in training from a young age. Yeah. And, um, and she's read your book and really connected to it too. Mm. Well, she is a teacher for me as well, because I need only spend five minutes talking to you. And what I see is this ability to be yourself. This is what the public sees as well, of course, well, and it, it is a you. part of your contribution. Because women and men spent so much time wondering about how I'll be received, uh, will they like me, did I make a mistake, did I say the wrong thing, will I say the right thing, this whole internal dialogue that goes on, which is this big for men, and it's this big for women. Yeah. And you give a kind of teaching that says, it's all all right, it's all okay. People are going to make a thousand mistakes, and the issue for all of us is, how do we resolve mistakes? There was this woman I interviewed for Gift of Fear, and she gave me this fantastic line. She had kept a lifelong diary, and as she looked back over her diary in her 70s, she said, there it was again and again, the ending embedded in the beginning. The entries wow. would be things like, um, met this guy, he kind of scares me, maybe shouldn't date him again. A few pages later, the drama. Met this guy, hope I don't marry him. A few pages later, marrying him. Wow. In the new relationship, just have to be careful not to get pregnant. And a few months later, pregnant. Wow. She had all these experiences where she had uh, documented the ending embedded in the beginning. And the ending is always embedded in the beginning. So if you get the signal, if you get the information, the gift I hope people take away is listen to it, listen to it now. If you're wrong and the person doesn't have some sinister intent, then okay. Yeah. That doesn't make any difference. No, and the worst thing that you've done is offend somebody. And I think so many women are trained that the worst thing they can do is offend somebody. My producing partner, Jenny Connor, and I had this year, I mean, I wish these stories weren't so abundant, but we were in a situation mm. where I was sort of very publicly verbally harassed at a party by a, by a professional colleague. My first instinct was to be embarrassed and keep it private. And Jenny went, no, why are we mm. becoming the secret keepers and the gatekeepers for other people behaving badly? Yeah. And they're not going to learn unless we make it really, really clear. It's not looking for revenge. It's looking mm. for a way to educate people. And so often they're not going to be educated unless they actually experience the consequence of their actions and the consequence is that we're not gonna to wanna to socialize with you and we're mm. not going to have a very... Stuff he didn't learn as a boy on some level or yeah. didn't learn as a teenager. And uh, one of my teachings that the universe has given me is, and I have 10 kids and so I've really had to apply this. That's so many kids, I'm so impressed. It's so many kids, that's true. <laughs> Uh, the, the teaching is do not save people from the consequences of their own choices. Yeah. Because when you want to save your kids, you want to say, oh, I know where this is headed. If you make this decision, it's going to go like this. But they learn through having their consequences. Now, if it's dangerous consequences, we might stop them. But if it's just the consequences of a social interaction that goes badly, they need to learn it. They need to have it. And I can't teach everything in advance. And as my kids were growing up and leaving the house and going to college and I swear, my kids learn more in the first two weeks of being on their own than I think they learned from everything that I said. Yeah. Are you comfortable sharing that story of the sexual assault in college? Yeah, I am. The reason I initially wrote about it was because I wanted to put a name to the experience and offer myself some catharsis. But what I realized in writing about it, I think that I didn't understand not only was my story not unique, it was mm. the story of 
every single other woman I talked to about campus assault. I was sitting alone with something that I didn't understand was being experienced by millions of other women. From the time I was assaulted, which is right when I turned 20, to the time that I disclosed publicly, which is when I was 28, that was eight years of sort of thinking that I was living in this private solo universe. There's a certain kind of shame that comes with an assault that you feel that you could have prevented. Mm. And I think society really tells us the story that what rape is, is you get knocked over the head with a club and dragged in through an alley by a stranger. And that is obviously a harrowing and real version of assault. But what happens to so many women is that they are coerced, manipulated, mm. or, you know, abused under the influence of drugs by somebody who they know. That's right. So I was in college. I was 20. I had only recently become sexually active. I was a late bloomer. Um, and I also was never able to hold my liquor. That was never a specialty of mine, and it still isn't. I have about half a glass of wine, and I fall asleep. And my best friend and I were going to a party, and she had a Xanax from her grandmother that we split. We maybe had two beers each. And by the time I got to the party, I knew that I wasn't quite fit for public consumption. Mm. I remember I was a mess. I kind of couldn't locate where my friends were. There was a guy who I knew from around campus and I knew to be a menace. I didn't know mm. that he was... You knew he was a menace. Yeah, mm. I knew he was someone who you didn't want to be stuck in a room alone with. Mm. I just knew that from looking at him, from seeing him at his campus job, from seeing him at a sports game, from seeing him at a party, you just looked at him and went like, that guy doesn't have anybody's best interest at heart. And I was at the party and I saw a figure in a camouflage hood and one of my best friends had that hoodie. So I went and I jumped on his back because I thought mm. like, oh, there's a safe person for me. I feel very out of my element. He turned around and it was this other guy. Mm. And I remember literally having the thought, and this was right before I basically passed out of, oh no. Like I knew that by initiating physical contact with this person who I didn't know, didn't trust, thought was a different friend, that I was in danger. My next memory is that I went outside to the parking lot and he followed me out there mm. and he came and forced himself on me. And I sort of said like, uh, will you get off me? I, please, I'm, I don't know what's going on. And he said he just wanted to walk me home. And then the next thing that I remember is waking up on the floor in my dorm room and with him on top of me. And I wanted to tell myself that it was a choice I'd made. I thought, okay, I don't remember getting here, but I let, remember trying to piece it together. Like maybe I, maybe I did, maybe we, maybe we had a romantic walk home. I don't know. Like, mm. and then I passed out again, woke up again realized that there was like a condom on the floor, but it wasn't on him, became very scared, asked him to get off of me. He didn't want to leave my room. My room had a door that went directly out to a parking lot. And so I just said, I remember screaming, please leave, please leave, please leave. He gathered up his clothes. I didn't even give him time to get dressed. I locked him out. He banged on the door. He finally went away. And I just remember sitting in the bathtub probably from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. And... The part that always hits me the hardest is that my roommate hadn't come home and I wondered where she was. And I thought like, where is she? I, I'm so scared, where is my roommate? And she said to me later, I came home and I heard the sound of a guy moaning. And so I figured you were having sex with someone and I left. And so the idea that there was somebody who heard it, mm. thought it was a consensual interaction and left, like is this sort of sliding doors moment in my life. Like, what would it have looked like? It still would have happened, but she would have been there to validate my experience and to mm. help me to recognize what had happened so that I could have reported it because I know that he went on mm. to do similar things to other women who experienced worse physical consequences than I did and just as much shame. Mm. And I look back at my diary entries from that time and I'm not able to call it rape, but I'm able to say, I don't like what happened. I feel embarrassed. My body hurts. And every year around the time that it happened, which was in December, like there's something about the way that the light falls in the winter where I get a terrible feel, like the feeling, all of the sensations of shame and mm. self-hatred and wanting to disappear return. I hear you. I have a cousin who's 18. When my little sister went to college, I mean, 
I'm such a broken record. I know it's not realistic to tell them not to drink. So I say, have a buddy at a party, mm. check in, make sure that you express your intentions for the night. Make sure that you don't just go to a party thinking, well, if I end up walking home with someone, I end up walking home with someone. Even if it doesn't turn into assault, that's not the kind of sex that you're ever going to really feel good about. Mm. Go out with bright eyes and clear intentions and a friend who will take care of you. And I know it's really painful for my best friend too. She felt so much mm. shame about not having been there to protect me, but we did not have the language to know that an act of violence could be perpetrated at a you know party with tons of gay guys and a completely liberal atmosphere. We thought that only happened at schools with an angry football team. We just mm. didn't know. And so a huge part of my mission in talking about my assault has been to look at the gray areas. And it's been amazing. Some of the public responses have been people going, that's not rape. That's just a mistake. When you're a person, you know what non-consensual sex mm. feels like. And I've had a lot of sex I didn't enjoy. And it's mm. a different experience mm. than waking up and knowing that something has been taken from you. And I would be lying if I didn't say that it changed the entire course of my adult life and of my ability to interact with and trust men, especially. I mean, just the fact that he was a person whose very presence mm. made me uncomfortable mm. tells me so much the ending was embedded in the beginning. Yeah, and I'm so sorry it happened to you. And Thank you. Do you think almost every woman you know has had some kind of victimization or knows somebody who has? Yes, and I also feel that when I shared my story, a lot of my friends were able to recognize experiences mm. that they had categorized as mistakes on their part as being sexually assaulted. And that's not me looking to say, oh, every man's evil and every time you had sex in college, it was rape. And every time you had sex it, you, drunk, it was rape. I had plenty of drunk sex in college that was messy, but consensual. Mm. But so many of my friends had blamed themselves mm -hmm. because they didn't understand that saying it's not rape because you were drunk lives very close to it's not rape because you were wearing a short skirt. Mm. We have to be able to enter the world with some level of trust that we, if we don't have every single wall up, we're not going to be attacked. And I do think that every woman I know has experienced, if not an out and out assault, they've experienced a feeling where they felt as though mm. their power was going to be taken from them. And it's a really complex thing that comes and goes from your life for a long time. This is women, period. Yeah. All women in Western society are affected by either the fear of this uh, or the reality of this. It's true. And when I fir it first happened, I said to my mother, something happened at school that was uncomfortable. Mm. It was, I had sex with someone, it was too aggressive. I, using the word rape was really scary for me because at that point, I thought about it as this sort of divide where it's like you were either a person who'd been raped or you hadn't. And once you mm. crossed that line, there was a sort of tainted element to mm -hmm. you. Identifying as someone who had been assaulted felt like it was a place you couldn't go back from. And I don't feel that way anymore. In fact, it's actually a huge part of my identity because I think it's important to, you know, make your identity more than just like, I'm Lena and I love gluten-free cookies. You have to also incorporate the challenges you've been through as, a, as one of your identity markers. And so there's a way that I'm actually very proud to have survived an experience like this and be in a position to look at it both emotionally and analytically. But when I finally said, I'm putting out a book and in it, I really identify that college experience as a rape. My mother was upset and in the moment, and she would be okay with me saying this because my mom is incredibly sensitive and well-spoken. She said, nothing like that ever happened to me in college because I really sent the message to guys that I wasn't up for it. And at that moment, it was so hurtful to me because I felt like what my mother was saying was, I sent the right message, which was stay away from me. And you sent the wrong message, which was, sure. I need love, please come it and do it at all costs. And my mother was so regretful of having said that, but it forced her to recognize her own mm. internalized stigma mm. in thinking, even as a rabid feminist, that there was some distinction between the personality types of women who are assaulted and women who aren't. The issue of rape on campus is something that's still being explored and we're learning a lot about, but, and I've read a lot of studies about it in an attempt to sort of understand it on a more academic level. And something they've found is one, that it's not that every college boy gets drunk and takes advantage of girls. It's a, it's a few men on every campus doing it over and over again, which I actually find comforting to know that we don't have an epidemic of, you know, innocent, kind boys holding girls down, but that in fact, there's a certain sort of profile 
of the kind of guy who will assault mm-hmm. a girl on campus. And I did read a study that posited that there was a certain type of young woman who is victimized, someone who wants... The serial victim. The serial yeah. victim. And that was, it was hard for me to read, but it was also important for me to recognize that when I was in college, I didn't have a tremendous ability to um, distinguish between positive and negative attention. Mm -hmm. And I felt um, that my self-worth was really defined by attention from men. And I don't think those things caused my assault, but I think that they put me in a situation where aggressively standing up for my own Mm -hmm. rights and for my own body was harder for me. Well, it's, it's rare that anybody talks about it, and, and thank you for doing it. I don't mean, I'm not talking now about the sexual assault, but yeah. that specific piece you just said about serial victimization. If anything, what I hope, gift of fear is, it's about personal responsibility. You have and to take it. You have to take it. You will be alone with someone who doesn't have your best interest at heart uh, or someone who's a serial predator or someone who by situation and circumstance is so uninhibited and, uh, and thoughtless, typically as a result of drunkenness, and he will victimize you. And so who's responsible? People say, well, men ought to be taught and men ought to learn, and I agree. But you could teach men and women and young men and women all you want and then get them drunk. I remember a college uh, president a few years ago, he said the number one thing we could do to reduce rape on campus is reduce drunkenness. And oh my God, he was pilloried. He was, everybody jumped on him. No, the thing to do is get rid of the rapists. Well, a lot of times the rapists are young, drunk men in a situation where by inclination or by circumstance, they're more likely to act than they would be sober. What I just said is highly unpopular, but I have to say it to my daughters. Of course, and it's very unpopular what I said about knowing that had I had a difference, had I, it's so weird because it's so highly connected to the messages we we received from society. I was chubby, I had acne, I had not received positive attention in high school for what I looked like. I felt like I was always the sort of person standing at the edge of the room hoping to be seen. Mm. And to admit that those things factored into the way that I was present at that party that night, that's not popular either because Mm. I do not take responsibility for my own assault, but I do recognize that I had a pattern of behavior in my life that kept me from embracing my full personhood. And the reason I know that is because after I was assaulted, I got into a relationship with someone who was, if not physically abusive, extremely emotionally abusive, manipulative, and sort of sexually volatile. And while we were engaged in a consensual sexual relationship, there were many moments where it crossed boundaries of what made me comfortable, and Mm. I was unable to express that. And it caused its own kind of trauma, and I see that as an extension of a pattern. And I think if you can't look at your own patterns, Mm. you just can't move past them. It's very true what you're saying, and and, uh, you know, this I've been very careful always about not blaming the victim. Essential. Sometimes I don't even blame the predator because of the way the circumstances develop. But ultimately, if you were going to choose responsibility, it's the predators. But look at this idea. Your party that you're going to be drunk at as a college girl um, is at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. And at 10 in the morning, could you change the course of that day by not going to that party? Yes, at two in the afternoon. Well, what I look for is this moment when you give up your choice, this moment where it is no longer a voluntary circumstance. So at four in the afternoon, getting ready, these are all times when you could simply not go. Now, my point here is not to say that it's your responsibility to not go because you should be able to go to a party. You should be able even to get drunk. But I would say getting drunk with boys you don't know versus getting drunk with girls you do know, I would choose the girls you do know. If the experience is to be drunkenness and to have a good time, I don't put them together, by the way, but so many people do. But there will come a moment in that day that you experienced where you have no more ability to choose. That's alone with him in a room and without your resources. Anybody who wants to pin this 
only on the man. The problem with that is if you don't have the ability to make a choice, then you don't have the ability the second time to avoid it yeah. and the third time to avoid it. You said you looked for all the things you could have done differently. And why do we do that? Why do we want to take responsibility? Why do we want to say it's our fault? So we won't have the experience again, we think. Yeah. If I can cause it, if I caused it by what I was wearing, by what I was saying, then I won't do that again. I won't yeah. do that again. But people who experience serial victimization do do it again. And the reason is yeah. no real personal introspective study of what was his role, what was my role, and what could be different in the future. Rape is not always being dragged into an alley. In fact, the overwhelming majority of rapes are with people you know and are consensual up to the point that it got out of hand. Yeah. You, people were there voluntarily. People were there because they chose to participate in a relationship. And why? Why? Because they couldn't say no so often. And how did you get the ability to, to say no? You have it now. You didn't have it then. No, and I didn't. And it's funny because I think about college and I probably would have kissed almost anyone who expressed interest in me, male, female, goat. I really was at a place where I just wanted to feel validated. I wouldn't have had sex with anyone who expressed interest in me. And I certainly wasn't interested in violent, non-consensual sex. But you talk about the moment you give up choice. At the party when that guy turned around and I thought, oh no, I probably would have still entertained a conversation with him for five minutes. I would have let him tell me that I looked pretty. I would have enjoyed those experiences. But the minute that I stepped outside my safety zone, the minute I walked into the parking lot, the minute I was mm. no longer surrounded by friends, there was no pleasure left to be had in the experience, but there was also no choice. And as I continued on, I had a number of experiences with this particular partner, but a few where I felt really... If not that I, I did not feel I'd been assaulted, but I felt like I had not kept my own best interests at heart as I, you know, it was like, to be totally honest, I mean, I've never been someone who's interested in drugs. I don't smoke weed. I drink half a glass of wine and I pass out. But whatever this guy handed me, I would have put in my nose, mouth or ears because I so desperately wanted mm. to be embraced by him. And honestly, it was... For me personally, it was finding my own creative voice, finding other ways to be validated that didn't involve sort of male attention and mm. some kind of approval of my body that I had been desperately seeking. That gave me the confidence to go, actually, I'm leaving this party and you're creeping me out. And mm. what I feel really lucky about is I came to Hollywood. I know so many women who ended up waking up in a creepy producer's house mm. or been you know, in a business meeting that really pushed the edges of propriety. And I had people talk to me in ways I didn't like. And I always walked out or said, I don't feel comfortable mm. with this or took them to task in my writing. There's nothing that is worth giving up my own bodily autonomy. I think an important solution to this is other women, which is that if, if uh, all women on campus would support each other, in a way that is not happening right now. And women in societies and women in communities and in neighborhoods make everything your business involving other women. Then you have an alliance. Yeah. My definition of healing is when you stop giving energy to something in the past and you have all of your energy available in the present. Yeah. And, and that's the moment that I think people have healed. I, I wanna ask you from experiences that you had as a kid, from the sexual assault experience, and from the daily experience of not being allowed to be your full self until you gave yourself that permission. Yeah. What were your healing strategies? It's a great question, Well, I had the amazing benefit of, I've been in therapy since I was seven. Mm. So being in therapy already and having some therapeutic language to use around things that happened to me, I had, this sort of identity around the concept of healing and working through issues. And then my mother also introduced me to transcendental meditation when I was nine. Mm. And I've worked with the David Lynch Foundation on trying to bring it to more women who have suffered from domestic violence because it's been scientifically proven to be a really curative thing for mm. women and their children who've escaped violent homes. Yoga, when I can bring myself to do it, and writing and being creative and expressing myself creatively and for me, one of the reasons that I feel healed is because I don't walk around the world with a tremendous amount of fear. Even when I receive, you know, threats for supporting Hillary Clinton or aggressive messages from the alt-right or 
creepy, you know, notes from men I don't know, or my father gets a phone call on his uh, cell phone with someone saying things about me no dad should ever have to hear. I think what an inconvenience, Mm. but I don't walk through the world feeling physically threatened. And I think part of that comes from being assaulted and making my way past that experience. Prevailing. Prevailing. Part of it comes from the fact that I have of, I mean, I have endometriosis, which is a chronic illness. And so I've had in the last, I've had, you know, five surgeries in the last two years. And that's something that I never thought if you had told me 10 years ago, would Mm. I be able to get through that? I'd go, no, I'm so afraid of hospitals. I'm so afraid of needles. I'm so afraid of pain. And so I think the more we make it through, Mm. the more, I think in the best situations, we then look back and go, oh my God, I'm so much stronger than I thought I was. And I wasn't able to see in the moment just how much power I was exercising, but your definition of healing, which I find beautiful, I feel very lucky to be able to say that, yes, most of my energy, most of my looping thoughts don't go to experiences that are in the past. They go to how to fix and accentuate the kind of positives of the present. It's very hard as a woman, especially right now, not to walk through the world irate. And so Mm. how do we use our creativity and our ability to organize and our ability to create a passionate sisterhood that that is saying no to the status quo. How do we use that without falling into sort of a well of anger? And anger can be a very healthy galvanizing emotion, but it's not a great one to live with on a day-to-day right. basis. You, I think it's very similar to fear in that you want the signal of fear. I, I, I want to be afraid of this thing, this noise I heard, this incident that might be dangerous, but I don't want to stay there. If you define anger as what it really is, it subsides super quickly. We then make a choice to hang on to it, yeah. to tell the story over and over again, to make it worse, to say how unfair it was, etc. It's a very good immediate response to something and a good emotion for galvanizing action, and none of these emotions can be denied. They're all real and you have to recognize them. But when you are angry at someone and you sustain that in your own story, you make them part of your life. Right now, being a woman in America, especially a woman who has a platform, you have almost no choice. You've been deputized to do something, but you cannot live in a state of constant shock, awe, and rage. Mm. You have to operate from a place of hope and love or you'll fatigue yourself to an impossible degree. You have to get to a place where you don't care what everyone thinks. I'm not saying you don't care what anyone thinks. Yeah. You might really care what I think about something and I be do. interested to you, and I care what you think about something Thank as well. You. But I cannot care what everyone thinks. No. When I'm writing something in a book, there are, if the odds are with me, 90% of the people will read it, understand it, take it on board, and have some value. And 10% of the people will hate it and will yeah. strongly disagree. It'll be a button for somebody, we're pushing people's buttons. And you have to be willing to do it because even the greatest things that I've ever said that would help millions of people in my greatest fantasy were absolutely offensive to somebody. All of the kind of trouble I've ever gotten in in my career, and I'm considered someone who sort of, you know, created a lot of hot water around myself, has always been- From people who are actually like-minded. Who are actually like-minded. Yeah and who agree with the same thing. I mean, there's the alt-right and I can never worry about what they have to say, but it's also always been for words, not Mm. actions. And it's a really interesting thing because I will look around and I will go, you know, Mel Gibson can make his way back from, you know, rambling drunkenly out of a place, punching somebody and talking about Jews. And I can't make my way back from making a comment about abortion that feels too real to somebody. I'm not saying I always speak perfectly, but I have a commitment to speaking honestly. And it's an interesting thing to see that sometimes honest speech is punished more by the, in the public eye than problematic action. And that's something that I've noticed specifically in Hollywood and specifically around sort of women who dare to get it wrong mm. or get it right, but in a way that people didn't necessarily want to see and internalize. And I'm not saying I'm a saint and I'm not saying I haven't made mistakes and I'm not trying to... I never try to demur from the responsibility of being a public figure, but I do feel the sort of essential challenge of communicating honestly about what it feels like to be a woman and communicating in a way that's not gonna make people crazy. Nothing is more offensive. Nothing is more offensive to people than a reality they would wish to deny. You know, in all the 
difficulty of this time that we're in, where people are marginalized and alienated and attacked online and called names and, and, and there's an expansion of permission for misogyny and racism, there is also more progress than at any time in any culture in human history. So yeah. I like to also look at the advances we make and say, it's not perfect, uh, it's a work in progress, but it is in progress. Light is what cures these things. Yeah. And we all have to say, uh, oh, this is what's actually going on yeah. in this society, in this country, in this time. Yeah. And we were very comfortable to be able to deny it. Yeah. And uh, it's always been so. And my strong belief is that media changes human nature itself doesn't change. And so, you know, where there was once no internet, uh, now there is. And then there's, uh, you know, all of the social networking sites, and they may change the, the method by which we communicate, but they don't ultimately change what we are, which is human beings who do have fears and hostilities and lack of compassion and compassion and openness and love. It's all yeah. in there. And it really takes the contrast uh, of these difficult times to appreciate the, the better angels of our nature, what Abraham Absolutely. Lincoln said. The least popular subject for many, many people, it's not race, it's not abortion, it's not gun control, it's reality. Yeah. That is a very unpopular topic. And what I have uh, attempted to do in my work is just tell it to you in, in hopefully a palatable way or a clear way, but tell it to you, this is real. And sometimes getting on the pages of a book makes it real. Do you think that people's aversion to reality makes it harder for them to protect themselves? Oh yes, intuition is knowing without knowing why. And it's honoring this knowledge that I've just received. This is a bad guy, this relationship is trouble, this environment is dangerous, I don't have advantages here. Denial is choosing not to know when all the evidence is there. Yeah. And denial is super comfortable for people because uh, it's better than saying, I'm about to be attacked or I have just been victimized, or I am being victimized. If you called me with a terrible experience in the moment, it, it'd be just better if it didn't happen, just better. And, and yeah. the really heartbreaking thing is when kids come to parents and they tell their parents what is happening at school with a bully, no, it's not. Oh, that's yeah. normal behavior for boys. That's so helpful to know and something I'm grateful for. My parents never had any interest in taking the easy route of like, oh, just ignore him or oh, it's probably not happening. If anything, they were the parents who came in and exploded the principal's office with noise. And even if at times it embarrassed me, mm. it kept me alive, it kept me safe. You were victimized yourself as a child in a, a situation that crossed the line with a teacher. And uh, if you're willing to talk about it, I think it's good for people to learn from. I am. What it started with is I guess what we now call grooming. I was in fifth grade, I was not a popular kid, I did not have a lot of friends, I was often eating alone, and I started to get an incredible amount of positive attention from a male teacher who would tell me how smart I was, how great I was, give me extensions on homework, mm. often not ask for my assignments give me small treats, share a chocolate at lunch or offer a soda, tell me how much better I was than other kids, why they didn't understand me. And so really establishing a base of friendship. And it turned into a situation where he was often asking in a way that let me know it was a command for me to stay back and spend time with him alone mm -hmm. at lunch. He would do things like rub my back and shoulders, rub my head. I mean, at this point, I was a prepubescent. I was 11 years old. This was an extremely stark case of someone with an inappropriate interest mm. in a child, it started to get me really teased in class because I started to be thought of as the favorite. When I would make the decision to not spend time with him, oh, hey, I'm actually gonna go out to recess or eat my lunch in the library, he would become angry, he mm. would chastise me, he would punish me by forcing me to get up in front of the class and give an answer to a question that we hadn't necessarily studied. There were consequences to my actions if I did not comply and give him the kind of attention and affection that he wanted. And I knew that he did not have pure intentions. I could feel that there was something extremely needy, dark, and inappropriate. He um, would talk to me a lot about his relationship with his wife who had died, his relationship with his new wife, how unhappy he was, things that you absolutely are not gonna share with a fifth grader because they're not gonna have anything to offer you. When I finally went to my mother and talked to her about it, it was because I had um, 
a dollar that my mom had given me like for the soda machine. So I was sitting in class playing with my dollar and he took it from me. He said, that's distracting. Took, get that from me after class. And I went up to him after class and I said, can I have my dollar back? And he stuffed it down his undershirt and said, come and get it. And mm. I said, I don't want to. I will never forget. As clear as day, he said, you're all talk, but when it comes to action. And I just walked mm. out of the room. I walked home. I told my mother and my mother went in the net, kept me home from school the next day, went in to talk to the principal. And there were about two weeks left in the school year. She pulled me out of school for the rest of the year. Mm. What I had experienced was deeply inappropriate and mm. invasive. And it was- And in, was headed towards sexual abuse. No and question. was headed towards sexual yeah. abuse. It's somebody who I later learned was a serial offender. I was not the only child who mm. was made uncomfortable by this teacher. I was just lucky that my mother was there to protect me. Yes. In your book, Not That Kind of Girl, available in bookstores now. <laughs> it uh, is. You have this line about life before fear, a life before fear. And uh, it stayed with me and I wanna ask you about it. The concept I was trying to hit on, and I think we all remember this to varying degrees, depending on how you know, euphoric and, and idyllic our childhoods were, which is that the moment before you understand all of the threats that are facing you. I was four when my mother's best friend died of AIDS. And I think that was for me the beginning of my understanding of there being sort of inherent danger to being alive. And there then, is. and there is. And another big bubble burst for me was being assaulted and realizing that I think I had always somehow thought that my feminist training, my education, my class status, my just all the factors of my life were gonna prevent me from having an experience like that one. And so to realize that- There is no inoculation. There's no inoculation. And the fact is, is certain people have certain privileges that prevent them from experiencing, you know, I will never know what it's like to experience systemic racism. I will likely never know what it's like to experience police brutality, but there is no inoculation from general pain and fear. And so I wish for children as extended a period of fearlessness as they can have, and then an education about fear that makes them feel like they're not just victims, but that they actually have the power to mm. protect themselves and the people around them using not you know, a library of guns, but their own intelligence. A good way to extend uh, what you call a life before fear for particularly little kids is, uh, is very little media. Yeah. Just limit media because the majority of regular commercial media is uh, uh, violent imagery, shocking imagery presented in a shocking way. I'm talking about the news, not the entertainment. And uh, the idea that you go through dinner with the local news on, are you kidding? And the kids yeah. are there and these are the images they're seeing, images that uh, Carrie Fisher said, uh, these are things that we spent thousands of years protecting children from, and now we are giving it to them in their homes. Yeah. And this idea that life is fragile uh, does permeate so many people, and because we see something that people only in wartime saw before, and that is uh, kids see thousands of deaths now in television. Yeah, These are true. things that people recoil from and that instead now are, are telecast. And so keeping kids from uh, too much television is a very valuable thing to do. Also, you mentioned a life before fear. Uh, life is a sexually transmitted always fatal condition. <laughs> that is the basic reality that people are fighting with the distractions of media and iPhones and iPads and internet and, and social connectivity and all, and products and food and drugs and smoking and all the things that we do to not look up at just the reality of this human condition. And then if you accept that idea that, uh, that life in this form, in this body ends and changes, uh, then you can start deciding what do you wanna do with it. Once you get over the denial of death and the denial of aging, and both of these are very popular, you can now begin to decide not how shall I die, that's not the important question, but rather how shall I live? And I love yeah. that idea of a life before fear because it reminds me that I can feel like that today. And here's the reason I can and you can too. It's knowing that fear will come and get me if there's a reason. Yeah. The signal will come if there's a reason. But in the absence of the signal, 
uh, I can go ahead and live this day. The trouble with media is it's sending the signal all the time. People are drawing guns on us in movies, yeah. aiming guns right at us in movies, and, yeah. they're, and they're stabbing at us, and they're chasing us, and they're shooting at us, and, uh, and, and we're paying. We're lining up to go and see violent yeah. imagery. There's a place for it in stories, so I don't mean to be Pollyanna about it, but no place for it for kids. No. What I observe is so many young women not paying attention to their environment because they're doing this yeah. out in public. Um, what do you think about it? What do you? I've had to be careful because I've actually had two physical accidents mm. from using my telephone. I fell in a pothole and a truck stopped. I'm not kidding, this close to me when I fell down on the ground. And I also broke my arm in that incident I actually, it's funny, I wasn't on my cell phone, but I was running to get back to my cell mm. phone because I thought, I've got an urgent text, I'm distracted, I need to know what's going on. And I wasn't in my body and I fell down on the set of girls. Um, it was nobody's fault except mine. It's interesting because for me, the internet's this multifaceted thing, which has given me so much community. Mm. It's really helped me to engage with a wide range of feminists. I've learned an incredible amount from the people that I've met. I've just learned an incredible amount from my online life. But it's also a place where I've had unfathomable threats of violence, an incredible amount of aggression. And sometimes I find myself going to my phone just to see like, has it changed? Is it better? Am I being validated? <laughs> and I've really had to let that go. But I do think that just the basic action of having your nose buried in your phone and six apps open removes you from this. The other thing that I think we also don't talk about enough is that the internet is starting to feel like the safe place mm. to meet people. It gets, it gets to feel safe because it's become so familiar. So and, normalized that we go know. like, okay, if I met this guy in an app and his pictures look reasonable, I mean, these are strangers. When I was growing up, it wasn't here. You've had it your whole life. Uh, but you know the expression, somebody has their, their head in the clouds. Yeah. Uh, now it's that people have their head and often their whole lives in the cloud. It isn't just me railing against the fact that young people today, blah, 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 and the internet is a big uh, uh, objectionable thing. Anything that takes you from the present moment uh, removes some of your choice in life. Yeah, and the other thing that I think women are uniquely facing is that women are constantly being fed this line that if they don't, that they are never going to meet someone when they're over a certain age. All those lines like, you're more likely to get struck by lightning than find an eligible guy to date when you're over 50 or whatever horrific, non-factual stuff we're feeding to women. And so women start to feel like going on the internet is their only option for possibly mm. finding companionship and they stop looking around the real world because they don't feel like they have a valid presence there. We are all human beings, and I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of. We can regret behaviors, we can regret choices, but to be ashamed of what we are and who we are opens us up to victimization and is itself a victimization. And I wanna ask you about shame because you are now publicly known for being willing to reveal who you are, for being willing to live in your body and not be ashamed of any aspect of who you are. I can't know what your experience is on the inside. I don't know if you're still feeling any shame, but my view is that the main thing to be ashamed of is letting shame control us. That's yeah. the one we kick ourselves for. And, yeah. and I wanna know both how you got there and how you're doing with shame. I've always felt like shame was the most corrosive emotion because mm. it isolates us from other people and it isolates us from ourselves and mm. it really places you in a box. And all the work that I make, the creative work, the political work that I do, whether I'm writing, whether I'm acting, whether I'm going on a talk show, I think about everything as an exercise in releasing shame mm. and in really trying to just accept myself as I am. It doesn't mean I don't ever experience shame, mm. but it means that I really try not to let shame limit me. And it's interesting, the times that I feel the most shame now aren't, you know, if somebody says something negative about my body or if I misspeak in public, I feel shame when I feel that I have failed myself or that I, when I've been held back by shame. Mm. And I think that's what you said about sort of letting shame control us is the most shameful thing of all. You know, I had a very, very public situation where I wrote about, in my book, I wrote about being a little kid and the story in which I was curious about whether my sister had a vagina and I looked inside of her diaper. I was six, she was one. You shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done it. I was, it was a huge mistake. Yeah. 
That being said, the response was as if I had admitted to being in a relationship with a child now. And it dogs my sister and me to this day. And the thing is, there was a part of me that went, oh, I never should have put that in the book. But there was also part of me that goes, part of my job was to say that there is a difference between childhood sexual curiosity and sexual abuse. And if we can't talk about the fact that children grow up thinking about being curious about sex, trying to understand each other's bodies, then we're denying children their humanity and their Mm -hmm. agency. We've been taught by society to feel shame for all kinds of things that we do all day long, every day, whether it's not have a perfect body or... Are you going to forget farting? And far, I guess there's farting, which I feel enough shame that I didn't even list farting. And so we've been taught to feel anxiety about all of those things. And so really, I think the biggest win we can have is to keep moving despite shame. For me, Mm. my biggest concern is when shame keeps people, particularly women, from protecting themselves. And Mm. that to me is its sort of worst contribution to our lives. And so, so much of my work and my life is about pushing past that shame and that fear to a place of honesty. And whether it's always communicated successfully, I don't know, but I know that it allows me to sleep much more peacefully at Mm. night. I love it. Thank you. Thank you.